in our case, who was a 65-year-old man who had um, a history of hypertension and hyperlipidemia and had undergone PCI of the circumflex artery a few months prior to this presentation. In spite of the PCI in the circumflex, he continued to have angina, and that is why he was referred for revascularization of a significant lesion in the mid-left anterior descending artery. Coronary angiography demonstrated severe diffuse disease in the mid-left anterior descending artery, and after consultation with the patient and the referring physician, the decision was made to proceed with stenting. So before we did the stenting, so we used uh, the combination system, the TVC combination of IVUS and ear front spectroscopy system on this, on this particular patient. Uh, and uh, the reasons for doing that is that in addition to getting all the information that intravascular ultrasound provides, mm -hmm. which is reference vessel diameter, length of the lesion, we also get uh, very good information regarding the composition of the lesion. So we can uh, very rapidly, without doing any extra processing, uh, determine whether the patient's lesion has uh, lipid core plaque in it or not. What we saw in this patient is that uh, there was a significant uh, large uh, lipid core plaque at the area of the stenosis. The patient had uh, um, a mean uh, a lipid core burden index of 614 and a maximum 4 millimeter lipid core burden index of uh, 819. So that was a very large circumferential lipid core plaque at the site of stenting. So based on this information, we knew from previous studies that there is slightly increased risk for having noriflow. The case um, was challenging because the patient had a fairly long lesion. There was, uh, the vessel distally was relatively small. So standing it required uh, putting a relatively small size stand, which subsequently was post dilated in order to match the proximal reference vessel. So we had to place actually two stands, one more distally and one more proximally, and then we post dilated the proximal stand at high pressures. This is actually when we started developing problems, as um, happened about uh, half, uh, half a minute after the last uh, post dilation, the patient developed severe ST segment elevation in the anterior leads. At the same time, he had severe substernal chest pain and he developed hypotension. When we did the angiogram, there was massive nori flow. There was essentially no undergrade flow into the LAD past that area of stents. And then we did give uh, large doses of um, nicardipine, which is our preferred vasodilator, as well as um, adenosine in order to restore undergrade flow. It took about 10 to 15 minutes mm -hmm. of aspiration, followed by local delivery of adenosine and icardipine before the patient um, restored his flow and the ST elevation resolved. So in this particular patient, not only did we see ST elevation during the procedure, and uh, we had um, uh, the nori flow and the chest discomfort, which required the prolonged efforts to treat, but also when we measured cardiac biomarkers afterwards, there was a sizable increase in both the CKMB and the troponin levels. So the patient did indeed have a post PCI myocardial infarction, which was presumably caused by embolization of debris from the lipid core plaque that was standard. I think another lesson from this particular case is that having large lipid core plaque, exactly because of its um, risk of embolization, may mean that we may want to be a little more conservative on uh, how aggressive we are in post-dilation. In this case, we did several high-pressure post-dilation after the stent was placed, exactly because there was a mismatch between the proximal and the distal vessel, and that, and that is when we realized that ST elevation occurred. So it is possible that by avoiding extensive and especially high-pressure post-dilation after placing a stand in a large liquid core plaque, that might also help from potentially preventing the cheese grating effect or this plaque resolution that can then go into um, the distal capillary and cause problems. So the availability of uh, both information, meaning the structural information from intravascular ultrasound, as well as the composition information from the near infrared, helped us uh, in two ways. One is we were able to determine what is the best size for the stand and uh, uh, be able to determine the length of the lesion more accurately. That was based on the grayscale intravascular ultrasound data. And then based on the near infrared spectroscopy data, 
we were able to determine that this patient was indeed at increased risk for, for having noriflow or post-PCI myocardial infarction. And that helped us because we were able to administer uh, vasodilators ahead of time. Although this did not really prevent the noriflow, at least we were very vigilant to this effect. We were very cautious looking at the electrocardiogram and monitoring the patient's symptoms. So once the, nor once the noriflow developed, then we were prepared and ready to go with the microcatheter, do aspiration and give the intracoronary vasodilators that eventually led to resolution of the symptoms and the ST elevation.